you're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition. And it lies between the pit of one's fears and the summit of one's knowledge. You are now traveling through a dimension of imagination. You just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Hello and welcome to a special episode of Anthology presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. I'm your host, Matt Hurt, and ordinarily, um, Anthology is one man's examination of the Twilight Zone as a first-time viewer. Um, each podcast, I share my first impressions, analysis, and overall thoughts on Rod Sterling's iconic series one episode at a time. However, uh, as you guys know, I've been doing a bonus episode review series on the CBS All Access Season 2 um, of The Twilight Zone from Jordan Peele and Simon Kinberg and Monkey Paw Productions. And as you guys undoubtedly know, and I apologize profusely for this, um, I have been on a little bit of a hiatus. And um, yeah, it's just, it's it kind of takes a lot to, to, uh, to do these uh, solo podcasts and everything. So um, so I had every intention of resuming the review series for season two of the CBS All Access show. And I, my intention was to have it uh, finished and <clears throat> good to go by uh, um, the end of the year. Um, and I was very delighted to have the opportunity to speak with Tanana Reevedu and Stephen Barnes, the writers of the episode of Small Town, um, and so that, that's what this episode is. This episode is my interview with Tanan, uh, Tanan and Stephen Barnes. And the, um, <clears throat> my original intention was to release this interview, um, kind of as a companion or, or connect it to my review of a small town, uh, which is still forthcoming, but I don't know if you guys can tell by my voice. Um, what happened was I, I had this interview with, with, uh, Tanana Reeve and Steven. And, uh, within two hours of that interview completing, I started coughing and had a sore throat. And basically I came down with COVID and it has been a roller coaster and it has been an infuriating roller coaster because I've been so careful and so, so mindful of everything in terms of wearing masks and, and social distancing and disinfecting everything, but I, I still caught it. So, um, my original intention was to resume the episodes and release them within, release the rest of the season two of the CBS all access show, um, by the end of the year. But unfortunately I don't think that's going to happen, but, um, I'm going to release this special episode, which is my interview with, with the writers of A Small Town. And I, I am so delighted that I got a chance to chat with them. And I'm so happy with, with the the information and just the, just the knowledge um, that they both shared uh, with me about not only the experience of writing for The Twilight Zone, but their experience of of working in, in that industry and the experience of just writing uh, like a collaborative effort of writing. Like I am such a, I am such a dork for that kind of content. And this was just such a, such, such a, such a, such a high for me. I was, I was so delighted. They were so nice. So what I'm going to do is release this interview for you guys to listen to. And then Soon, I'm going to finish my season two reviews of the Twilight Zone, the Monkey Paul Productions Twilight Zone, because um, I'm very anxious to get to those reviews and everything. I just haven't been able to within the last couple of weeks because, to be fair or to be frank, this is the most I have been able to talk without going into hacking coughs and everything. Like it's it was bad. Um, I my highest that my fever got was like 102 and I mean, just, just excruciating headaches and shortness of breath. I, it was, it was terrible. Um, so yeah, but I'm, I'm at the end of it now or I'm at, I'm, I'm on the rebound of that now and I can actually talk into a microphone for an extended period of time without being <clears throat> doing that. But yeah, so I'm very fortunate that I, I was able to hopefully um, get clear of this of this thing. So, um, 
per my doctor, I do have a couple, uh, about a week and a half left um, of staying off of work. So maybe I'll feel up to, to recording some podcasts in that time. But in the meantime, um, I'm going to go ahead and release this episode, uh, my interview with Tanan Reeve Dew and Stephen Barnes. Um, just super friendly, super, uh, I, I really, really loved chatting with them. So um, I hope you guys enjoy this interview and um, thank you so much for supporting me. And um, I do want to mention also that uh, you can find more of Anthology as well as full episode archives um, at anthologypod.com. And if you want to contact me, you can use the Facebook page at facebook.com slash anthologypod or tweet me at ovanthologypod or send an email to matt at obsessiveviewer.com. And finally, if you want to support the show and get access to exclusive content, go to patreon.com slash obsessiveviewer. And so I actually just recently revamped the reward tiers on Patreon for Obsessive Viewer Podcasts. So if you pledge $1 or $2, you get access to a Patreon-exclusive uh, RSS feed. That is just a lot of me and the, the other co-hosts on Obsessive Viewer um, just kind of chatting, kind of... Um, kind of free form discussions or, or chats and everything. It's, it's a lot more laid back and, and fun. Um, to check that out. But if you pledge at $5, you get access to, um, you get access to that as well as commentary tracks that I, I'll, I have been and will be recording. My goal is to release at least one in one a month next year. So hopefully that, hopefully that pans out. And then finally, if, uh, the higher tier of that is $10, which gets you access to exclusive, all that exclusive content as well as, um, advanced and unreleased content. So, um, I actually have episodes of, Anthology, the first two episodes of the of reviewing the third season of the original series Twilight Zone, up on that feed, um, because I ha- I re- recorded them and banked them with the anticipation of of releasing them after I finish the the new Twilight Zone series on the podcast. So those are there if you want to check that out now at the ten dollar level. But uh, those will be released hopefully in January on the main feed here. So. Yeah, so, okay, so without further ado, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and, you know, play my interview with, with Tananarive Du and Stephen Barnes, the writers of A Small Town. And, uh, yeah, so uh, thank you once again to them for, for chatting with me. They were very, very uh, gracious with their time, and I, I, was, I was delighted to be able to chat with them. And, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the interview, and thank you guys so much for listening, and I'll see you next time. Mr. Jason Grant, a man looking to make a big difference in a small town. But being the change you wish to see in the world is a lot more complicated when you've got that whole world in your hands. It's all a matter of perspective here in the Twilight Zone. All right, so hey guys, I'm here with uh, Tanana Reeve Dew and Stephen Barnes, the writers of The Twilight Zone, Season 2, Episode 8, A Small Town, um, which is, that it is my favorite episode of the two seasons, and I'm just delighted to, ha- to have both of you here on the podcast to kind of gush over it with you. <laughs> so, Sounds good. We're yeah. delighted to be here to have yeah. you gush over it. Yeah, gush over, gush over <laughs> me all you want. You, you know, know just like- I, I feel like because of the pandemic, we didn't get as much... Gushing. Of a splash, mm-hmm. as you usually get yeah. when you have an episode of TV on television. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we're happy to have this conversation. Absolutely. I mean, it was uh, it was very meaningful to me because it was the first television I'd had produced, the live action television I had produced in almost 20 years. Oh, wow. That's so, incredible. So um, I'd had a severe career interruption because of family issues. Mm-hmm. And logically, I shouldn't have been able to work my way back into Hollywood. <laughs> uh, you know, ageism and other things mm-hmm. just, you know, should have prevented me from doing that. But I'm a stubborn cuss. Mm-hmm. And I've got a great partner. Boy, is he a stubborn cuss. <laughs> and boy, does he have a great partner. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And I mean, you do need that with something as uh, competitive and, and as as 
what I assume is hard to get into uh, in the industry. Insanely hard. Everything. And it was your first time? First time? It wasn't your first time? Uh, yeah, it was also, well, uh, the, I wrote for the Phil DeGuerre 1970s version of the Twilight, or, or the 80s. late yeah, 80s version 80s. of the Twilight Zone, too. And I grew up on the original one. I watched the original Twilight Zone in, in first run. So, you know, I'm, nice. I'm, 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 there was a dinosaur right next to me while I was watching it. <laughs> um, it it so it that was unusually meaningful emotionally mm-hmm. uh completion is sort of a homecoming so i was exceptionally happy to be able to to do that and to work with with jordan peele and monkey mm-hmm. paw and win rosenfeld mm-hmm. those those guys they're the best and mm-hmm. for me my very first television episode we co-produced a short film in 2013 mm-hmm. So I built my IMDb with that in like a short that we did with Blair Underwood. But in terms of someone hiring me to write a script for TV, very first time, wow. could not be more excited that it was the Twilight Zone. Even though like you, Matt, I did not really grow up watching it as a kid. I knew it existed. I knew it was a thing. Mm-hmm. I saw probably six of the original episodes, like the yeah. guy who broke his glasses. I wore glasses, so I remember that. Yeah, just Meredith. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that, that one sticks out. But I was not a child of the Twilight Zone. So this to me was, well, just the thrill of having a produced television episode. I knew mm-hmm. I knew the reputation, obviously, of the show, but just so excited, like Steve said, to have the opportunity to to work with with Jordan Peele mm-hmm. and, and Monkey Paw. That was the big win for me out of this. Oh, absolutely. I can only imagine. And congratulations to, to both of you for it. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so... With that, with that in mind, the kind of the the mammoth undertaking it does to it takes to to do something of the stature of the Twilight Zone. Did you have like any kind of um, not reservations, but did, were there were there any were you conscious of like the property of the Twilight Zone when you were creating your episode? You mean well, there was a lot of emotional pressure for lots of different reasons. The stature of the Twilight Zone wasn't one of them. I mean, that okay. that was part of what made it fat, what made it fun. Mm-hmm. I wasn't thinking, oh my God, Rod Serling's ghost is watching. And I just <laughs> no, no. It was more like, oh my God, Jordan Peele is watching. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> you know, it was it was it was more immediate. So the, I think that the you have a creative artist has two different parts in their head at least Mm -hmm. one is the part that creates and the other is the part that judges what you have created and that part is always more sophisticated Mm -hmm. and therefore it is always more spartan more critical uh and uh it 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 will tell you about everything that can go wrong and all that you've done in the past has gone wrong and you know all of that all the reasons that this can't possibly work while the part of you that creates is just the kid that says let's put on a show so (laughs) There were lots of, you know, there were lots of, of, of voices in my head that were not optimal, you know, and I just have to accept them. You know, they're part of the, the, the bestiary. I want to go to the Wayback Machine and talk about how it all came about. Oh, that's OK. That was and, it, and it was Twitter, how we met, Matt, actually. Yeah. Oh, um, wow. After I saw Get Out and fell mm-hmm. in love with it. I proposed a course called The Sunken Place. I teach at UCLA. Nice. I was teaching Afrofuturism, which is basically mm-hmm. black speculative fiction. But, oh, kitty. But, um, <laughs> but I was tweeting about the fact that I was doing this class. Uh, a reporter for io9, a freelancer named Evan uh, Narcis, uh, who has since become kind of famous, actually. I uh, had a profile on the New York Times recently. Uh, reached out and said, I'd love to write a story about your black horror class. The same day his story came out, Monkey Pop Productions followed me. I was already following Monkey Pop Productions, of mm-hmm. course. So you know how it is on Twitter. They follow you. You can send a private message. Mm-hmm. So I sent a private message. Thanks so much for the follow. And, you know, I'm at the age now where I don't even care. If you don't ask, you don't get it. <laughs> so I said it would be so great if Jordan Peele could visit my class. You know, whatever. Wow. Just give it a shot. Yeah. Jordan Peele himself, within two hours, got back in touch with me and said, ha ha, I could surprise them. And that's what happened. He came to the class. It was a little viral visit. One student posted like a three-second clip. That was it. Wow. They did. They were very protective of his privacy. Mm-hmm. Three-second clip. It went viral. He talked about us on the, uh, not the Daily Show, but Stephen Colbert. Mm-hmm. And based out of that meeting, Steve and I were both there. We went to Monkey Pot a Pitch. Okay. And at the time, um, Lovecraft Country was already put together. So mm-hmm. I missed that train. Yeah. 
Uh, and and they they thought the Twilight Zone would be a good fit for some of the uh, the stories we had pitched. Yeah, we pitched a bunch of ideas, and they didn't make it into the first season. Yeah, the first did. season we couldn't quite hammer it down. Gotcha. Um, and then in the in the second when the second season came, uh, Tanana and I were actually up uh, in Idlewild at a writers little writers retreat that we did for our, for each other, just like three days up up in Idlewild in a cabin. And we heard from Twilight. Well, let's back it up. They reached out to us. That it was before, It was during. It was on our way back from the Idlewild, wasn't it? Oh, I thought we were already uh, excited and talking about it on the way there, like literally on the phone with them while we were driving up there. No, I don't remember whether or not we, anyway. were, we were doing that on the way there, <laughs> but I do remember that they reached out to us on the way back. We were literally driving home from it, where we heard that you know that our pitch or we were open to pitch, mm-hmm. or that they wanted they, they wanted to work with us. Yeah, they were like, we we really feel bad. We couldn't figure anything out first season. Let's let's yes. give it another try. So. So, yeah. you know, we're we we're, came, we're pitching we... a lot of different ideas mm-hmm. and, you know, th- they come up with in-house ideas and they will, you know, they'll say, well, what would you do with this idea? And then we'll, we take do a take on it and or we offer them an idea of their of, of our own and we, they take a look at it. And somewhere in the midst of that exchange, we zeroed in on an idea that was originally called Tiny Cul-de-Sac. Yes. Uh, okay. And there were several different takes on it. And it evolved into a small town. Right. We thought a small town would be a better title mm-hmm. for that. And <laughs> because it's a it's a pun. You know, it's it's right. a it's a small yeah. town, but it's also a town with small minds. Right. And it's right. also the model in <laughs> right. the town. Right. So, you know, that that three way pun appealed to me. And so I said, Yeah, that 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 works pretty well. And in case any of the actors are listening, I feel <laughs> a personal responsibility to let them know that when we wrote that script, we said desert town. We did not say winter town. We did not have a <laughs> drop of snow in our scripts, but unfortunately, the town they found, I think it's called Ash, I mm. want to call it Ashcroft. Maybe. Uh, it's in British Columbia. Right. I, I was thinking that about something in Arizona or New Mexico. Right. But they, they shoot in, you know, in uh And there were references Canada. that would have placed it there. And when they changed that location, we had to go in and tweak some dialogue and stuff yeah, like just that. just tweak some stuff. But uh, we were under very strict NDA, mm. of course, not to talk about anything. Right. And we weren't really hearing many details about the schedule. They keep a pretty tight ship. No. Yeah. <laughs> We you had probably the, know. <laughs> we were given the, the 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 opportunity to fly up and and visit the set, oh, but wow. because we have a, a child in high school, mm-hmm. uh, only one of us could go. Okay. Because I have been on sets of of shows while the, I've been on the sets of most of these shows that I that I've written, um, but Tanara even never had that experience. So it was like, okay, I stay home, you go. And the way we even heard about the shoot underway is because I, I basically was doing just a random Google search for a small town in Twilight Zone in case someone like yourself had heard some kind of tidbit, you know, like mm-hmm. someone who's a super fan might know something <laughs> that I hadn't heard. Sure. And all these stories started popping up, including the CBC, which is like the national news outlet in Canada, oh, wow. about the shoot. Let the, the whole crew of Twilight Zone, 275 people descended on this town the and it's just like the episode the diner was bustling <laughs> i mean it was their slow season where yeah. they, i mean all these articles and interviews everybody was so shocked they brought in the giant spider they had a real giant spider that was walking on the street he was very well trained but i mean here we were under nda mm-hmm. And I like I can't even retweet this story because it gives it's like but this oh, is yeah. CBC it's like national news <laughs> right. that they're shooting our episode right now the mayor giving all kinds of they were uh, they did cameos I mean everybody I'm telling you there must have been like uh, a dozen stories everyone who was an extra wrote a blog post or a story about the experience oh, wow. of the Twilight Zone shooting in their town <laughs> and you just had to kind of. Kind of take that all in and not spread it or anything, or or you couldn't you couldn't really uh, comment. No, on it. it was uh, because honestly, <laughs> um, a we had signed an NDA and right. it's the legal thing. But 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 secondly, <sighs> we have so much respect for for Monkey Paw mm-hmm. and for Jordan Peele. We would never 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 do anything to yeah. to go back on on our word over something as silly as like publicity <clears throat> or trying to get the word out mm-hmm. early. What was the point? You know, all right? You want to bend over backwards when it comes to stuff like that. Oh yeah. And, to be uh, super careful. Oh yeah, and, because you just never know. Right. Not having been through this process with them before, <clears throat> even though there was, there were newspaper articles in mm-hmm. Canada, us saying something about it publicly through social media might 
trip some lawyer someplace. Yeah. yeah. Who then says, these people are not nice to play with. <clears throat> and then and then I don't get the invitation to the set visit, you know, which which right. it was too difficult to pull it off. I really, really wanted to go to that town. Or you don't get invited back to play again. Right. Yeah. But, but that's, was- that's really what I'm more concerned about. Mm-hmm. It's having the reputation as someone who's good to play with. Yeah. There are character actors in Hollywood who are not great actors, mm-hmm. but they're always working. Oh, yeah. And if you look into it, what you find out is these people are great. Mm-hmm. You know, they you know, they play cards with you and they bring donuts to the set. They always know their lines and they always hit their marks. They're never any trouble. Professionals. Mm-hmm. They're professionals. They're adults. Nice. Okay. In a business that often seems to be filled with, with children, broken yeah. children. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the idea is Good point. to be the hardest working adult I can be, to be to to be easy to play with, to be fun to play with. When when someone gets off the phone with me, I want them to feel better about life than they felt when they got on the phone. I figure if I can be that guy and also a good writer, I'm going to have a career. So yeah, we uh, we we turn in our drafts on time. If they said you know chop out twenty pages, we're like okay, we'll chop okay. out twenty pages. Right. If they say oh we have some budget issues, we need you to rework the third act. It's like okay, no we'll problem. The third act. So we were we're that person, and and even when I was I, I couldn't go to the small town because logistically it was just too difficult. Small planes, the hotels are filled, but they said you could watch the interiors. <laughs> Uh, on the sound stages where they shoot in Vancouver, mm-hmm. which turned out to be just great. I got to meet Damon Wayans Jr., who stars in the episode, oh, nice. um, and the young man who played Emilio, whose name is is uh, and uh, is slipping me, and uh, and also Alfonso Alvarez uh, Barreda, who the was the director, yeah. who was really really sweet, and like me, was so super excited just to be doing it. You know, mm-hmm. so we, yeah, we kind of related on that level. We were like, oh my god, <laughs> we can't believe this. <laughs> yeah, just just a comment about that. If you if you're around Hollywood. You'll notice that people use the phrase, we're super excited to, you know, to do this, to meet you, to read. Like, and it can feel, you know, the, the old thing used to be, oh, we love your work. We love you. We're big fans. Big we're fans. the biggest fans. Big fans. <laughs> and it sounds phony. <laughs> it is Except funny. that it's not exactly. <laughs> it really yeah. isn't. Because enthusiasm, <laughs> emotion is the fuel that gets the rocket going. If you, When you stop, when you lose that enthusiasm, you shouldn't be working in a dream factory anymore. Mm-hmm. So the people who are there, they will say things like that. And it's partially because it's true and partially because they want to gin up their enthusiasm so that they'll have the fuel necessary to power the project. So you know, I make fun of it, but I also understand it's necessary. But I mean, oh, being absolutely. there um, on set, mm-hmm. you know, I guess I have to say I fell in love with the model. Mm-hmm. That's the thing I remember. Oop. Oh, you still there? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. the model was... As you see in the episode, because it's beautifully shot, so intricate yes, the and detail. detailed. Are you frozen? So good. Is it me? No, no, oh, no okay. frozen. So uh, <laughs> it was so intricate and detailed. I, t- I was taking all these pictures of it. And I think people were very nervous that I was taking pictures because I expected <laughs> them to show up on Instagram. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but they have not. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I was literally almost like a kid in a candy store bouncing around that set. Just, they, you know, they have had a long slog of a shoot. They were in this yeah. freezing cold town. <laughs> now they're just wrapping up the interiors and I'm showing up fresh and bouncy. It's like, oh, my God, this is fun. <laughs> so I, I, I have a feeling maybe I was a, a slight irritant. No one said it. No one even behaved like I was, but I kind of felt like maybe I was. Yeah, the, the writers better. are not the heavy hitters on a set. You know, it's like a story, but you hear about the Polish actress who screwed the writer. You know? yeah, I mean, but, <laughs> but I was very impressed. They were able to pull out one of those folding chairs with the word writer on it for me to oh, sit nice. in. So that was exciting. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice. It's a real, it's a real privilege. And one of the things that I hope you can pick up on here is that the role of a writer in Hollywood is not the same as the role of the writer in New York in, in, in oh, publishing. That a writer, your script is not a piece of literature. Mm-hmm. It's not a story. It's the blueprint for a story. Yeah. It's the schematic mm-hmm. for a story. And all these artists, you know, the, the production people, the director, the actors, all those people have to come in and take your schematic and turn it into something real. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Okay. And if, if you understand that, then you can suspend some of your ego. You're part of a team. Mm-hmm. You're here to, to help the team pull the plow. No one dog gets that sled across Alaska. Mm-hmm. You're yeah. working together. And yep. It's an honor. I mean, it really is. And it's very difficult 
to get yourself into the position to to have this opportunity. It's much easier to sell a short story or a book. Far, okay. far, far easier. Hollywood is, it, it's impossible to get in and people get in every day. Mm-hmm. So it, everyone's story about how they got into Hollywood is going to be a little bit different. Right. So you, you study that. Yeah, it, it can't always be, I invited Jordan Peele and he came to my class. <laughs> <laughs> That's not likely to happen again. You know, and it's always stuff like that. It's like, seems like really random things, but. Well, um, she's good at these random things. Things. I don't understand. <laughs> she really does have a touch of magic about how, you know, the, I, she landed a whale with a spider web is the way I put it. Well, I've been publishing uh, horror and specifically black horror since 1995. Mm-hmm. And it, it was a tough road in terms mm-hmm. of adaptation and uh, getting diverse casting, for mm-hmm. example. So Jordan Peele was a kindred spirit in my mind from the minute yeah. he appeared on the scene. Mm-hmm. I love what he's been doing in both the film and the TV space. Oh, me too. And I have a, a special uh, special regard for the way they really adhered to the casting in the way we wrote mm-hmm. it. Now, there were things that were changed. I knew as soon as I got there on set and I was hearing the, the scene, it's like, wait a minute, I don't remember those lines. So I was like, <laughs> let me see the script. So there were some changes in the script. But the things that they really held, I mean, the major pieces were still there. Like, for example, we had mentioned a wedding ring, but we didn't have like a big wedding ring at the end. That was, oh, okay. I think, somebody's brilliant idea. I like it. Um, but uh, we wrote the ethnicities of the characters. And Steve, you can contrast the way it used to be. We wrote Damon Wayne's character as black that the pastor Nikki was black, that her husband was Filipino. They actually hired a Filipino actor to play her husband. I looked him up oh, on IMDb. He fantastic. was actually Filipino. Um, the Latino family, mm-hmm. um, all of that was on the script level, and they really just adhered to all of it. See, in contrast to that, the first story I wrote for the original Twilight Zone was called Teacher's Aid, uh, starred of Adrienne Barbeau, who I'd worked with on Maud at CBS when I was a tour guide and she played the Maud's daughter. Oh, wow. Um, I it's going back. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Uh, <laughs> I have a story about a Christmas party that I probably will not tell. Um, anyway, um, there was a, she was an inner city remedial English teacher who gets possessed by a demon okay. who, that helps her deal with the, the gang that kind of plagues the school. And the gang was very clearly written black. Mm-hmm. and they cast it white. I did another story for The Outer Limits um, called The Heist, I think it was, about a street gang that hijacks a an armored, a military armored convoy that they think is filled with Stinger missiles, and it's actually pieces of the Roswell UFO crash, and there's something alive in there. And they said they could not have this be a black street gang because there weren't enough black people in British Columbia, and they would have to import Negroes to Canada. <laughs> oh, wow. um, it was just... And I saw that, and it was like, oh, it's like that. That's what they're going to do. And and I thought, because they were shooting in Canada again, that they would have a difficult time. Mm-hmm. But whether it was camera angles or whatever it is, they managed to create this very diverse small town, which one article pointed out, is where do we see that in television and cinema, this oh, small absolutely. town that is actually also multi-ethnic. Mm-hmm. And that is something that stands out in the episode in a really great way. It's something that it also, like the kind of sense of community comes through really clearly. And kind of especially since it, I mean, it aired in June, like when we're in the middle of a pandemic and everything, that's, it kind of had this interesting resonance um, for for its airing and stuff. So, Um, but yeah, that kind of sense of, diverse community kind of coming together is uh is really strong in the finished product excellent yeah well you I'm may sorry. have had some questions matt okay. yeah <laughs> we just got blah, blah, blah. Oh, no, this is great <laughs> i appreciate it um i do want to ask how was the like what's the process i mean you guys have worked together obviously for for a, a long time i'm sure like what's the process of actually like creating the the script and everything and uh, was this one of the in-house uh pitches that they had or was this something that you guys pitched and um it was it was an in it was a, when you, when we say an in house pitch, they they might have come to us with a log line, yeah, a log like a one just, sentence premise, yeah, and then and we then fleshed what, it out. What would we do with that? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Who would be living this story? What would the beats of the story be? So you know, being married and knowing that we wanted to write together, I set up a rule from the very beginning that the relationship itself could never be on the line. 
mm-hmm. that the writing and the relationship had to be in two different rooms. Okay. Because if, if an individual artist will fight with themselves about images and thematics and stuff like this, yeah. then if people are in a collaboration, they have to be able to fight. Mm-hmm. They're going to have, you know, passionate, deeply held points of view, even when she's wrong. <laughs> And if we're and not, especially when he's wrong, and if we're not free to tear each other a new one, mm. then we're not going to get to the good ideas. Oh, yeah. So it's going to get intense at times. Mm-hmm. And th- the only way to do that so that there's no fear if 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 this argument goes south, it might damage our love. It might damage really. There can be no abandonment issues. Yeah. There can be no sense. No, there's no side door. There's no back door. Neither of us is looking for an exit. This is it. Our marriage is it. We're just, we're committed to that. What? So can I add something? Yeah. When we went to meet in person and we did meet in person with Jordan Peele and Wynn Rosenfeld, yes. we brought five takes a combination of our takes on a couple of in-house ideas and a few original ideas. There were some that I had liked more and some that Steve had liked more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So a small town turned out to be one of Steve's. Okay. That he that meant that he took lead on it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's the other thing. Whoever, sometimes you'll see something that we write and her name goes first. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's my name goes first. That tells you who it is that wrote the first draft. Unless okay. it's just alphabetical, which is kind of confusing because sometimes we're <laughs> almost close to even. No, we've never done that. Like Kitchers is almost close to no, even. No, 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 no. Yeah. I, did, I did the first draft on that. I know. That's why my name goes first. Yeah. Anyway, some yeah. of them will be alphabetical in the future. I don't think so. I think because, <laughs> you see, here's the thing. That in working with Larry Niven, which, which was my education for, uh, for science fiction, mm-hmm. um, one of the things he, he taught me is that somebody's got to have the kill switch. Mm-hmm. Somebody has to be in charge. Now, you can flip a coin, but somebody has to be the one to ultimately say yes or no. Otherwise, you can get to the point where you can't make a decision and the project dies. Oh, yeah. So that will never happen if, if one person gets to say, okay, this is how we're going to do it. You know, you can listen to the arguments, you can do this. You can do that. And so sometimes she's the one with the kill switch. Other times I'm the one with the kill switch. But I don't think it's ever going to come down to 50-50. All right. Well, so in this particular case, and this is the model for how we work on everything, and one of the reasons we're able to work so well and so quickly mm-hmm. uh, is that we outline. You know, it happens that in television you get paid for that outline. But whether or not we were paid for it, we can't write a script unless we have a detailed treatment slash outline that we have both agreed upon. Now, because she has her way of, of, of dealing with the story. I have mine. So if we don't have an outline and she goes off and writes the first draft, I look at this like you went someplace. I can't write this. Uh, yeah. Right. So we agree on the broad strokes or actually we agree on quite a bit. Like it's all laid out in the outline stage. Yeah. And then the person who is uh, taking lead writes the first draft. And, and we don't like sit side by side or anything like that. But we do use a computer program called Writer Duet, which is free, by the way, writers. I like it just for screenwriting, even if it's not a collaboration. But it's perfect for collaborating. Um, you can write on it simultaneously. That's oh, right. Wow. It's really wonderful, like a Google Doc, and, you know, on, only, with, only with formatting. And new text pops up in red, so I can watch what he's writing while he's writing it. <laughs> and yeah. vice versa. So, and I can, I can write five pages a day. Mm-hmm. Um, it takes me about 40 minutes. If I know where I'm going and I know what's going on, um, all I do is kind of, you know, go into alpha state, imagine the scene, and I type what I see. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so it's it's garbage. You know, it's full of mistypings. And if it's text, then, you know, the syntax is off and the, and the grammar is off. Like, I don't worry about any of that. It's just get it out of my head and onto the page. Once it's on the page, then maybe tomorrow or the day after or next week, I'll go back and work on it. But – it's like I separate out the the flow state from the editor state. That's all that writer's block is, mm-hmm. is a confusion of flow state and editor state. If you separate the two of them out so that you're just flowing, you don't worry about the quality of it. You can write all day long. It's mm-hmm. garbage. But if you let yourself spew garbage and then you understand, well, what is it that produces the flow? Well, it's the quality of your input. It is the, the degree, in other words, you consciously work on improving your, your flow. It's a little bit like martial arts. You practice things perfectly, 
And then one day you're going to turn around and there's a fist heading at your face and you respond in some way. That's the garbage. And, 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 and you, you, the work that you did in the school will make your garbage better and better and better. Mm-hmm. And that, that's true with your writing too, that you're constantly refining, you're constantly studying, you're looking at it, you're watching the best movies you can, you're reading the best books you can, and you trust that your subconscious mind, that, that the unconscious competence part of you is going to slowly get better and better and better. So wow. The part of you that the editor part is always going to look at the garbage that's flowing out and it's going to be saying, oh, man, you know, that's crap. But my philosophy is that you keep digging through that pile of horse manure because you know there's a pony in there somewhere. So, yeah, and going back and forth, polishing as we go, discussing ideas. Then we come up with uh, visual symbols to sort of show more about the character. Uh and then you end up with a rough draft, and then they say, or a first draft, and they say, "Oh yeah, we I know it, it's we need like twenty pages cut out of this or whatever." Uh, we had more about the mayor and his family in our original draft, oh, um, and one of the changes that must have happened after our last draft that I really like actually is that more of the blame for what was going wrong was shifted to the mayor. In our draft, the mayor had been a little more successful in riling the townspeople oh, up against the boy the child uh, so that they work smaller, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. the town itself was a little bit smaller. And in this version, they refined that uh, so that the mayor was almost immediately mostly to blame that his, his efforts were unsuccessful to try to scapegoat the boy. Right. It's a softer version of the story, but seeing it on screen, I think it works very well because one of the things you don't want is to be too on the nose. Mm-hmm. And my impression is, <clears throat> that what they never know exactly what they want from you. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't want you to give them back the suggestions they gave you. They want you to give them what they would do if they had all the time in the world. Oh, okay. They don't. Okay. Right. So understanding that reading between the lines, trying to create what they would do if they had the time mm-hmm. and, the, and the background to do it. And then the understanding that once you finish it, then they're going to take it in house. Yeah, and they're going to do what they need to do, you know, based upon their budget, aesthetic, based the budget, on whatever. the other other scripts that they've got in, mm-hmm. what's happening, the 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 arc of 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 emotional flow through an entire mm-hmm. season, you know, the, you you just, you don't know what that is. You're not sitting in the room right. with them. So the idea of being able to work with them in that sense was a real honor that they mm-hmm. would trust us. With how much did they? How much budget was the budget on that? It's, it's no. not public. It's not public. No. Okay. <laughs> I assumed you could look that up. No, you know. but it's a very high budget show, okay. um, which is one of the reasons they they decided to do it. And the thing I learned is that a whisper is a shout mm-hmm. in television. I learned that from watching Damon Wayans do his lines on camera, which seemed to me as an observer like very understated delivery, like. And when you see it on screen, there's so much more nuance than you. Can, it's not a stage play. It's not like you're sitting in the audience and you can see the nuance. It's camera acting. It's different. Yeah. And so that was a huge lesson. And the second huge, huge lesson was in terms of the theme, because, you know, Twilight Zone has social justice themes. That was kind of what hung us up first season is they couldn't quite figure out the social justice angle on our story. Okay. That was one of the big hangups. So this one, you know, there were some people who thought, well, you guys, it's the mayor supposed to be Trump. It wasn't really literally supposed to be that, but of sure. course you have a town with a bad leader who was basically riling up the town uh, mm-hmm. to try to turn on some of the citizens of color. I could see where there yep. would be some parallels there. Oh, absolutely. But in softening it and making the town not respond to it as strongly, having their ire turn more toward the mayor and less against this boy supporting the family, you still get your message across. Oh, there, he's still the only little Latino boy in this town. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's terrible that the mayor is accusing him of you get all that punch, you know, but with without the town being dragged into it, I thought it was a more pleasant viewing experience and felt less on the nose than it would have felt if the whole town had turned on this kid. Yeah, I wouldn't have wanted to do something that was specifically political. I'm not specifically political. I consider myself philosophical mm-hmm. about things. I wouldn't have minded, but um, whatever. But- <laughs> <laughs> you say tomato. No, I, I say rutabaga. Um, so it's, like I said, it's it's threading a needle. One of the, thing, the ways I used to look at writing in Hollywood is that you have a bunch of different moving needles. 
and you have to put a thread through all the eyes. They're producers and actors and directors and story editors and showrunners and all these different people, all of whom have to say yes, Mm -hmm. all of whom have creativity, all of whom are intelligent people with, with sensitivity. And if you can figure out how to stay loose enough to listen to everything they're saying and find a way to create something where the core of what you're doing is strong enough that even after you change it, it still feels like yours so that you look at it on the screen and you say, well, they're all the, you can, there are people who focus on the changes and think, Oh God, that's not mine. They'll take their name off. And they, they, or you can look at it and say, there is enough of what is that I did something here that was good for these other good, smart, creative, intelligent people to be able to express themselves. Yeah. You see two hundred, almost 300 people involved in this. These are people who are paying bills, putting their kids through college, building their own careers and portfolios. What you create has to work for all of them. And if you can do that, and still have that sense of individual pride, that little kid inside you saying, I did that, <laughs> then you can work in this industry. And the idea that we said it was a small town, so they found a small town. And then because of the impact of that, they had a booming winter season that they, they oh, were not yeah. used to having. Uh, we gave people jobs. You know, we filled up hotel rooms. That that was such a humbling experience oh i can imagine and that location that they that they found is just gorgeous like that it is that it it was it's really it really pops on screen Um, this is a good thing i understand it has been discovered by hollywood and is going to be busy (laughs) (laughs) but uh we were some of the first to uh to get it shot there i just want to make sure is it british columbia i want to make sure it's british columbia ashcroft is it that sounds that's possible. Okay. Anyway, it's a tiny little. Uh, we the way we described it in in the script, and I think this was your language, Steve. You, in order to call it a one horse town, first you would have to find the horse. <laughs> You'd have to lend it a horse. Lend it a horse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's one of the first lines of the script. And they were like, "Okay, bet," and that's what. They did. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Um, I wanted to ask you about specifically the 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 tone of the episode. Um, I like I I have a couple of different podcasts. One is a, a Stephen King podcast, and this this episode feels very much like in in the same vein as like a Stephen King story. And and I know that I know that's that, high I, praise. No, I love it. He is the master. Well, he's oh. the king of small town settings, isn't he? Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. So, and oh, yeah. I, more than that to me, he's he's brilliant at taking values and 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 he's brilliant at understanding what you love mm-hmm. and then attacking it in some way and then yeah. showing how people either fail their moral test or come together and, and rise. And this is why he is, he was, you know, the great 20th century storyteller as far mm-hmm. as I'm concerned and is still okay. a vital force. Yeah. You know, the, the man is, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's an amazing. Yeah. He's yeah. A, also, have you had a chance to talk to him? Oh no, 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 no. I, that would be, that would be uh, a dream come true. Oh yeah. <laughs> I haven't, but he is, yeah. Well, I hope you get that chance oh, because thanks. he's. Uh, I've, I've, I had the honor of meeting him a few times. It's an honor, you know. Actually, had the opportunity. My second book, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he's uh, he's 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 priceless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, we interrupted he you. Will Sorry, not oh, no, no, you said Stephen fine. King, and that is the word that makes us. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Talk a lot, but. Uh, in terms of the tone, yeah. Um, there's also, I mean, yeah, there's that. There's that sort of Stephen King-like setting and sort of the human frailties that are uh, fueling, say, the supernatural element of this oh, story. Yeah. But it's also decidedly, I would think, more lighthearted <laughs> than right. most Stephen King, <laughs> intentionally so. True. Well, he can be pretty lighthearted in his short stories. Okay. Yeah, I've, seen, I've seen some very funny Stephen King, but, but more people die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we, this was more fam- Nobody died nurse, did family it? friendly, <laughs> you know. Um, yes, there's a giant spider, yeah. but this spider doesn't really hurt anybody. So right. that kind of thing. It, it was Stephen King without claws and teeth, I would mm-hmm. say. I but I, you know, so that. we that's that's one thing to to take note of that mm-hmm. that if we know that we don't want anybody to die, mm-hmm. 
then how do you create tension? You create tension because you know it's part of a series, Mm -hmm. and then in other episodes of that series, people did die. So the audience does not know what's about to happen. So that's one one of the things that we constantly remind ourselves of. You know, people don't know what's about to happen here. So even though we know that we're not going to kill more than a couple of people, Mm -hmm. as far as they're concerned, we're going to kill off everybody. So we've got (laughs) tension because of the expectations of the genre Mm -hmm. or the series or other films that are similar to this or other things that you and I have written you don't always have to put people through the meat grinder. But also, yeah. and we named the character Jason after our son, Jason. Oh, that's uh, nice. The, the real horror is what is this power going to do to him? Mm. Right. What is this going to do to his heart when he has the ability to hurt other people? And, mm. and, and by extension, the audience members, we get to ask ourselves, what would we do if we had this power? Yeah, you see, I don't believe that power corrupts. I believe that you know, in, in absolute power corrupts absolutely. I believe that that was some guy's opinion and that there are a lot, a lot like sunlight or rain, that whatever is in your flower bed will grow weeds or roses. And so it is a test of character. That's that's my position on it. So when I'm writing something, I, I, do, I think you were a little bit more in the power corrupts category, weren't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, you see, because I, I think people have to sort of, uh, but when you don't have the power, you really don't know who you're going to be. Uh, that's true. Yeah. When that's you're true. talking about a revelation of but, character. But what I'm saying is that what you just noticed there, that conversation, that gives you thesis and antithesis. Mm-hmm. That two things that you need in a story anyway, that that you that you can literally go into it and say, well, I think that power is neutral. You think the power is is negative unless you, you know mitigate against it. Those are two different positions on power, which then get to act out through different characters in the story. You now have the oppositional force that you need to drive drama. Yeah, the pastor would have done very different things with that model. That's um, right. The mayor, obviously, but, would have done very different things with that model. So I'm saying that to say that she, not even I don't have to agree mm-hmm. that we can actually put our disagreement into the story itself it's part of what powers it because otherwise i'd have to you know i'd have to take both positions myself you know if you're doing a story on child abuse you know child abuse you know once you're abused you'll never heal now, you know, the other other point of view is no child abuse can be overcome with love okay and so those two positions thesis and antithesis work together to ultimately create synthesis where you say well it can create you might even have a character and then you have a sub character that that each of which is exemplifying a different point of view in what it is that you're doing thematically um so all that stuff you know the primary thing is are you telling a good story all the stuff about thesis and antithesis and you know and synthesis and and thematics are these people behaving in ways that are consistent with your understanding of human psychology and human behavior that's right yeah and ultimately it's just you know people don't want to be taught they want to be entertained exactly so you know one of my one of my mentors told me that your book has got to have at least as much be as least as entertaining as a six pack of beer because they cost the same thing (laughs) (laughs) oh that's great uh, let's see. Okay, I think I might be running out of time here. Yes, um, I think you are. Um, yeah, yeah, we talked your ear off for a <laughs> Oh, no, this was great. <laughs> I, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to chat with me. And um, once again, congratulations on the episode and everything. It's, Thank you. It's Thank phenomenal. you so much. It's very we're... meaningful. Yeah. So glad you like yeah. it. I, oh, yeah. I cannot... Props to the director for the visual mm-hmm. sense he brought because we had the mural yeah. and all that in the script, but he brought it to life. Absolutely. Using Mexican, like when, his own background. As when a, you... See yourself as part of a team, and the team will have people on it who are smarter than you and will do things. And it's, it's all you want to do is you want to give them your best. Mm-hmm. You know, give them your best. You know, take the football and run, mm-hmm. you know. And then if you can sit back and look what they did with it, then, like I said, you can survive in this business and feel happy and feel like you've done something with your life. Oh, absolutely. That's that's a great sentiment. And the collaboration on the episode came through – like it, it – seems like the having had this conversation with you guys the collaborative the collaborative effort just created just such a such a strong episode that i i love dearly so i definitely appreciate wonderful you guys doing that I'm delighted <laughs> so yeah. glad you liked it yeah, yeah. um afrofuturism uh, webinar.com yeah yes. yeah yeah i was gonna ask what do, do you uh want to just tell people where they can find you online yeah, yeah if you like your hearing stuff. our voices and hearing mm-hmm. us talk about speculative uh arts we teach a course online, digital download, on Afrofuturism, basically black speculative fiction and the history of it, uh, at Um 
afrofuturismwebinar.com. And on Black Horror, it would be sunkenplaceclass.com. Nice. And, you know, Jordan Peele actually, uh, before all this, uh, Skyped in yeah, we <laughs> to have, that class. So, yeah. <laughs> Tony Todd is on it. It's, you know, it's, it's yeah. wonderful. We, we got very lucky. We know so many wonderful people in, in the industry right now. And it's a blessing. I do not for a moment. Like I said, I wasn't supposed to be able to get back in. Mm-hmm. So I am in, I am treasuring every moment of this new cycle. Of yeah, I'm on my fourth nice. career. I wasn't supposed to get in at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I'm really looking forward to what you guys do next. And I can't, I can't wait to, uh, to, see what you guys do <laughs> we'll, we'll talk so again much. you Let take care when the podcast is out oh all i right. definitely will thank you and guys send us and... the link so we can publicize it oh all right. absolutely all right okay. bye-bye. Bye-bye. we can never calculate what change our actions will bring into the world despite our best intentions and whether they will be for good or ill yet without action the stars themselves go cold jason grant wanted to change the world for the better But the power to do so got the best of him until he lost it all. But today, perhaps losing it all, both for Mr. Grant and for the town of Littleton, was the beginning of something new. Lonely hands find each other in the shadows, both in our imperfect world and in the Twilight Zone. And now, here's a short clip from our Patreon-exclusive RSS feed. To hear the full clip and more exclusive Patreon content, go to patreon.com slash obsessiveviewer and become a patron at the minimum rate of $1 per month. Thank you and enjoy. Like, one of the things that I really love about TV in a weird way is, like, looking at the episode titles. Mm. Um, Because sometimes I think they can be really clever and everything. Yeah. Like, there are a bunch of episodes of The Office that have, like, a double meaning. Like, the injury is both Michael's foot injury and Dwight's concussion. Yeah, And the secret is Jim's crush on Pam and Oscar's homosexuality. Right. (laughs) And so, like, they do, like, fun stuff like that. But I will say that the series finale of Lost was one of those times where I was like, okay, I shouldn't like this, but I do. (laughs) Um, Do you remember what the title of the series finale was? I don't. It was The End. (laughs) I thought that was really good. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of Lost, I love Lost so much. It's been a long time since I've watched it. You know, it's me too. And I've I've recently gotten back into watching a little bit of it at a time because Kirsten and I are doing The Lost Point on uh, Obsessive Viewer. Mm Mm-hmm. And a friend of mine posted on Facebook, like, what are what are um, scenes from movies that immediately make you just tear up and cry? Um, mm. And I was like, well, and like I like in my head, I had a few a few, um, and I'll I'll ask you that question, then we can go into the episode. Okay. But um, I had a few keyed up, and I was like, there's a common thread with these. So I was like, okay, well, apparently the composer Michael Giacchino has a direct link into my soul <laughs> because. <laughs> Uh, the, the scene in Up, not that one, um, the, the, at the end of Up, not the beginning of Up, like the beginning of Up is tragic and sad and makes me cry too and everything, but I will be reduced into a blubbering mess at the end of the movie where, spoiler alert, he goes through the scrap, scrapbook and like he sees that I'm getting chills just thinking about it. Anthology is edited and produced by Matt Hurt and presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. For a full archive of our episodes, go to anthologypod.com slash archive. You can also like the Facebook page at facebook.com slash anthologypod, and follow the show on Twitter at OVAnthologyPod. If you enjoy the show, please take a couple minutes to leave us a rating and a quick review on Apple Podcasts. This is the easiest way to support what we do, and all it costs is a little bit of your time. If you'd like to donate to the podcast, you can make a PayPal donation at anthologypod.com slash donate or support us on Patreon for recurring donations and access to commentary tracks and B-roll audio recorded exclusively for patrons at patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. Every donation goes toward paying the fees to keep the podcast running and is greatly appreciated. Official Anthology merch, including shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more, can be found in the Obsessive Viewer's Tee Public store. You can find a link to the store in the show notes of this episode and at anthologypod.com slash donate. Or you can simply search for Obsessive Viewer at teepublic.com. 
For information about the Obsessive Viewers annual live event showcasing short horror films from local filmmakers, check out shocktoberinirvington.com. And for an archive of all our events, as well as news about potential future events, head over to obsessiveviewer.com slash live. For more podcast content, you can find our flagship movie and TV review and discussion show, The Obsessive Viewer Podcast, at obsessiveviewer.com, and on Twitter, at Obsessive Viewer. You can also find Tower Junkies, a podcast where Matt and co-host Tiny share their love of all things Stephen King and his magnum opus, The Dark Tower series, over at TowerJunkiesPod.com and at TowerJunkiesPod on Twitter. And finally, check out The Secular Perspective, Tiny's side project podcast, which tackles current events and life's big questions from the perspective of secular hosts Chad and Amanda at TheSecularPerspective.com. Bumper music for this podcast comes courtesy of As Good As It Gets, which can be found at facebook.com slash as good as it gets band. You can also find As Good As It Gets music on Spotify, Google Play, and iTunes. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Kitty! (laughs) 